testing. <laughs> Hello, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, order, thank you. Um, good evening and welcome to our special Planning Commission meeting on November 7th, 2016. Please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Flag is there. Thank you. May we have the roll call, please? Good evening. Good evening. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce Bonnie Shen. She will be our translation for this evening. And Mandarin, Bonnie, would you like to share the microphone with me? Uh, Commissioner Bakshi, excuse, Commissioner Walk, oh, excuse me, uh, Vice Chair Walker, excuse, Commissioner Quigg, present, Vice Chair, uh, excuse me, Commissioner uh, Davis, here. Here, present. Okay. Thank you. So for this meeting right now, we're going to just have a presentation regarding the general plan and an update, um, a wrap up our a wrap up of our design charrettes. Staff, I'll hand it over to staff. Great. Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for attending tonight. Tonight's going to be the final wrap-up of our week-long design charrette, uh, the activities that we've had uh, through town, downtown. And in those activities, uh, you may have participated in one, many, or even all of them. Uh, so thank you. Uh, if you weren't able to attend any of the events, tonight's the night that you can, you can hear from our project team what the wrap-up is and, and uh, what occurred at those activities. You're also going to hear about all the, uh, the uh, ideas that were generated from those workshops. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to um, Jim Stickley. He is the specific plan uh, uh, manager who is leading the efforts. And we'd also like to acknowledge that uh, at about midpoint of this meeting, the group of us will be attending a planning commission meeting next door. So I apologize ahead of time for any disruption as we attend another meeting. And please, you're all welcome to attend if, if you have time for that. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Stickley. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Sorry. I'm Jim Stickley with WRT, and it's my pleasure to be here tonight to give our wrap up of the workshop last week. How many people in here attended some portion of the workshop? Okay, thank you all for participating. It was uh, very well attended. We had 40 to 50 people in each of our sessions, and it was extremely productive. And for those of you that did not attend, we're gonna give a summary of everything that happened last week okay. and um, just try to give a flavor of, of where we ended up. So first I wanted to introduce my team. So on the general plan team, we have uh, Chelsea Payne, and my colleague Punam Narkar from WRT, and then we have uh, from Kittleson Associates, I'm sorry, your first name again? Mike. Mike. And, and, and Alice Chen from Kittleson, Jim Hyde from Urban Green, uh, Terry Bottomley from, from Bottomley Associates. And am I forgetting anybody on our team? Okay, so um, I'm gonna just kick this off. So. Um, what we did last week is we really focused on the, the downtown portion of, of Millbrae. It's called the PDA, uh, the Pri Priority Development Area. And it is a subset of the, the overall general plan that is being, uh, that is being led by, by Mintier and Harnish and, and Chelsea's team. And so our focus last week was to really zoom in to the downtown area and talk about issues, problems in the downtown, both on El Camino Real and on Broadway, in the station area, and you know all the way to the north end of, of El Camino Real, uh, which comprises the PDA. 
and it was, as I say, extremely productive. And so we're going to get into explaining some of those specific ideas. Uh, first, Chelsea is going to give a brief summary on how this fits in with the general plan work. All right, thank you very much, Jim. So the, the city right now is undertaking a really big effort, uh, three parallel planning processes. So we're working on the general plan, which is the overarching long-range plan that addresses the whole range of citywide issues. And then we also have the priority development area specific plan, like, like Jim said, is focusing on the downtown, the El Camino Real corridor. At the same time, we're working on an active transportation plan, and that's a plan that'll be focused primarily or solely on bicycle and pedestrian issues in Millbrae. So all of these plans are, our consultant team are working on all of these plans at once, and they're all, they all have some overlap between them, and they're all going to be consistent to make sure that there's a consistent plan for the city of Millbrae. The city did receive a significant amount of grant funding that's going towards these efforts um, from Caltrans and from the Regional Council of Governments. So uh, these are largely grant funded efforts. Um, Jim introduced some of our consultant team members. Uh, we have a, a much larger consultant team working on this effort. Uh, we're Mintir Harnish, we're the, the project lead and we're, uh, we're leading the general plan and managing the contract overall. Uh, Jim and Poonam are with WRT, and they're leading up the specific plan portion. We have an economist with Applied Development Economics. We have transportation specialists with Kittleson. Um, urban Green, uh, Jim Hyde with Urban Green is here tonight to talk about some uh, urban design real estate. And then Bottomley Associates is a, an urban design and city planning firm as well. Um, in addition, we have some environmental specialists that are going to be looking, addressing the environmental issues that come up as part of the projects. And then we have some technical support uh, that are helping with outreach, infrastructure, uh, and translation. So we have a, a big team that's, that's assisting in this effort. <coughs> and we kicked off this process in March of this year. Uh, we started with a, a joint study session of the Planning Commission and City Council. And we had a community workshop uh, that, was, that took place here in this room. We then prepared an existing conditions report that compiles a whole range of background information about the city of Millbrae. And from there, based on all of our research and our, our conversations with the community, we prepared an issues and opportunities report as well as a draft vision report. And I'll, I'll talk about the draft vision in just a minute. So that was the basis, that was the foundation of all of the information that we had going into this community workshop series last night. And the feedback that we got from this workshop series, while it's primarily focused on the downtown specific plan, uh, it'll also feed into our general plan efforts and our plan for active transportation. So as a follow-up to this workshop series, we're gonna begin to draft those three plans We'll go through a public review process, environmental review, and adopt the three plans simultaneously. So I mentioned that as part of the general plan, we prepared a draft vision, and that's what's here before you. We want to make sure that everything that we work on is, is consistent, and again, working towards this broader vision for the city of Millbrae. So in, in summary, our vision, so our plan looks out to the year 2040, so this is the vision that we've, we've painted working with the community uh, in Millbury for the year 2040. Millbury is the gem of the peninsula, distinguished for its strong sense of community and as the premier transit hub. Uh, residents are proud to call Millbury home because of its pristine views, attractive neighborhoods, distinguished schools, and quaint and lively downtown. Millbury is a destination because of its access to transit, vibrancy of the El Camino Real corridor, diversity of retail and restaurants, and charming atmosphere. Millbury exemplifies a healthy and prosperous community. So that's the draft vision that we've worked with the community to prepare. And uh, f with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Jim to talk more specifically about the PDA-specific plan. Thank you, Chelsea. So the PDA-specific plan, as I said, this is a, a portion of, of what's being looked at as, as citywide for the general plan. Uh, and the, the specific plan for the PDA, which is the area colored here in blue and purple and including the station area plan, is a comprehensive planning document for a specific region of the city, in this case, uh, concentrated along El Camino Real 
and Broadway uh, in your downtown area. Uh, it includes the, brand, the Grand Boulevard initiative, which has been done in all the cities all along the peninsula uh, that, that El Camino Real passes through. Um, and the downtown area, which, which are the central focus of the areas of change uh, in, the Mil in the Millbrae General Plan. So here we have a view, as you know, of uh, El Camino Real and of, uh, of Broadway in the downtown area. Uh, the PDA is an area designated by the uh, Plan Bay Area document, which is a regional document that places emphasis on certain area, usually around transit, uh, as targets for intensification of either housing-related or work-related uses. And so one of those has been designated uh, here at Millbrae uh, near the transit station. So what we're doing is looking at the PDA in the context of the entire city, um, the, all of the neighborhoods that go up the hill uh, and that, that use this central area uh, for shopping, for dining, and for access to transit. And so I think we're very conscious of some of the findings of the general plan and how people view the function of the town as a whole, how they're able to come down and access the downtown area and, and use that area in their everyday life. So we're definitely looking at the PDA in the context of, of the entire community. This is the PDA. So it consists of three main areas, the El Camino Real Corridor, which is this long brown area, the downtown area here, uh, which is the, the area uh, centering around Broadway, and then the, uh, the station area specific plan, uh, which is this area here. The station area specific plan has already undergone its own study, and uh, which is quite a, a detailed specific plan in itself. That plan was adopted, and there are land uses that are identified uh, throughout the station area. So uh, this is El Camino Real here, running north-south, and Millbrae Avenue, and these are some of the land uses that are planned within the station area specific plan. And so as we look at the El Camino Real PDA, which runs through here, uh, we're very interested in understanding how that corridor interfaces with the land uses in the station area specific plan. And we're interested in uh, access points, crossing points, pedestrian safety, uh, all of those kinds of things. So I think that although there's, there are portions of the station area plan that have been addressed, that the, the, the PDA can certainly make uh, additional recommendations about corridor safety, about crossing, and perhaps even about how some of the uh, land uses that front onto uh, El Camino Real might want to interact uh, with the corridor. Uh, so many of those issues were part of the discussions that we had last week uh, during the workshop. I'm going to turn this over to Poonam for uh, a little bit about some of our analysis work. Thanks, Jim. Um, as Chelsea said, we really started this process um, in March uh, of this year, and between uh, then and now, there was a, a lot of analysis work that was completed, uh, which is available in the existing conditions report that's on the um, on the general plan website. And some of these exhibits are just uh, these are just excerpts from that because they are relevant to the specific, uh, uh, particularly the, the work that we are going to be doing on the PDA as well as um, they were relevant to uh, the activities that we um, did during the charrette. This, um, uh, is, this is a diagram about uh, you know, just characterizing, um, characterizing the fabric uh, within the PDA. As Jim pointed out, there are three distinct areas, and each of these areas have very unique uh, they ha it has a unique character. El Camino Real has a character of its own, which is very different from the downtown uh, because of, um, of course, because El Camino Real is a much bigger, right, it's a wider right of way, it's a bigger through uh, arterial road. 
whereas downtown has a, a more walkable and pedestrian uh, friendly feel to it because of the scale of the buildings, how uh, the uh, buildings, um, closely the buildings are to the street and the relationship of the, the street and the buildings and so on and so forth. So uh, really what was important for us was to I understand what those differences are and what those unique challenges are in each of the area. Um, and you know that we have characterized in this diagram also identifying uh, these three connections as the major connections um, across El Camino Real uh, from the neighborhoods to the station area neighborhood uh, from the western side to the eastern side and um, you know just <coughs> connection to the downtown. This diagram summarizes, um, we are particularly looking at the issues around connectivity and safety, and uh, these identify um, some of uh, uh, the challenges around the intersections along El Camino Real. Some of these intersections, which are in bright red, are the ones uh, uh, that we are characterizing as high conflict areas, which have, exp where you, um, there have been incidents of, um, higher incidents of fatality, as well as um, a lot of challenging environment for pedestrian crossing. And um, this particular one is um, looking at vacant buildings or underutilized parcels. And by underutilized parcels, what we are really referring to is uh, parcels where um, the building footprint is not um, is is not is much lower than what the FAR or floor area ratio allows, which means that there is a lot of potential for for development to go. Um, or, or that is more appropriate for the amount of land that is available. And as you can see, some of these parcels within the station area are also here. And a spe the specific plan, the station area specific plan is identifying these as opportunity areas and proposing um, uses. I'm gonna hand over to Jim Hyde. Thank you. I'm just gonna jump ahead here for a second. Um, so uh, the work that I've been doing with the team as well as Doug Spenson is um, really dealing with this kind of this title of off the shelf and into the ground. One of the things we heard the very first evening, I think, from people and heard as a kind of recurring theme throughout the week was, sounds like some great ideas, but we've all seen plans come and go. How do we know something's actually going to happen? And the work that we do is uh, part pragmatist and part optimist. So we're looking at trends and we're trying to understand how those might impact positively uh, what we're trying to achieve in terms of an outcome. And then there's the pragmatic role of what do we have to work with and how do we shape that and direct that over the life of the plan to actually make uh, things become real. So on the pragmatic side, um, there's a couple of very interesting things that Doug did in his initial analysis. And this is really setting the foundation for what will emerge as the plan as it continues to be refined. And typically, we work with four different food groups, if you will, in terms of land use. We have office, we have retail, we have hotel, and we have residential. And the point of this exercise is to understand by looking at what's there on the ground, what's available in terms of capacity, uh, what's the spending power in the community, and are you missing opportunities for retail or for office or for new residential? And then how can we use that and shape that through this plan over time? So one of the things that is a, I think is a big item is the retail is actually uh, underserved here in terms of the amount of square footage that so they look at, the amount of dollars that are available to be spent in the community, is that being spent elsewhere instead of being spent here because there is not, um, the shops are not here to support those. So there's actually 165,000 square feet of potential new space just with the population that's here now. And by the time this builds out over some of the other projected additional population, another 185,000 square feet. So that's a pretty good sized uh, amount of retail. That would be the equivalent of about uh, a, a major shopping mall. If you, not that you would do a shopping mall, but how you might distribute that. Office, uh, there's a severe lack of office in this area until the specific plan around the transit gets built. Uh, in the peninsula alone, it's down to 2.1%, which is considered a very, very low rate. Typically, somewhere 5 to 7, even 10% is considered uh, relatively in balance. So there's a real shortage of Class A office space. And as communities try to become more sustainable and have employees working in their town so they don't have to get on the highways, they can actually walk, and also be able to support all that retail that we just talked about, that's a really important dynamic to try and balance out. 
Uh, hotels, uh, I'll show you in the next slide, are a very important part of the community, as you probably know, because they generate a lot of uh, additional money to the community without costing a lot in new services. And then the last one is residential, uh, vacancy rate of 5.3%, which again is considered a relatively low number. Um, and so there's room, as we know, the Bay Area in general needs more housing, and this area could probably benefit from some additional housing that might be not only units, but might provide different housing formats for changing household size and makeup. This is an interesting slide, because what it says is, if you look at, once you build something, there are certain services that you have to provide to maintain those. Police, schools, fire, uh, uh, support from the uh, planning offices, et cetera. And so what do those generate in taxes and what are those costs in terms of services? And so what this does is it takes an acre of each type of the land use that I just mentioned and compares how much money, how much net money they provide to the city. So residential is a little bit more than break even, but because you have a lot of those services, schools, uh, police, et cetera, they're really, uh, the, what they generate in property taxes is about break even to um, the services that they cost. Retail's a little bit better, but hotel, because of the transit-oriented tax or occupancy tax that you have, the TOT or the bed bat tax, actually generates a lot of dollars per, per acre. Now that doesn't mean you'd put hotels throughout the rest of the town, but it is a valuable asset to the community, and you want to use that judiciously as we assemble the plan. And then office also provides a good bit of additional uh, income in terms of property taxes versus what it costs in services. So I'm going to jump to the trends part. That's kind of the backdrop of what we're working with in terms of the plan. Now I want to talk about the trends, and there's an important trend that everybody's heard of. Everybody's heard of the millennials? Everybody's tired of hearing about the millennials? <laughs> um, but they really are an important part of shaping the future of our communities. And not only because they are the, the household formation, the employees, uh, the people that are spending the most on retail, but in many ways the patterns and the things that they're seeking are very consistent with what the other end of the population, the baby boomers, are looking for. So this is out of a, uh, an interesting report called the rebound rate wave, how millennials are driving growth in smaller cities. And it's really looking at what are the things, not the big cities, because we've all heard about San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York, but they're starting to have a big impact on smaller cities because the urban life is getting a little tiring, they're starting to have families, they want to come to a place like Millbrae where you've got great schools and the housing is a little less expensive than maybe in downtown San Francisco. And you can read through that, I won't read it all, but the things that jumped out as me is, you know, they're looking for cities that cater to their lifestyle preference. So the first one is walkable neighborhoods with an availability of transit options. Now, I realize when you get up on the hill, it's a little harder to walk, but down here on the flatlands where you've got this great main street of Broadway, close to a significant transit hub, you have some great assets there to continue to build upon. The other thing is looking for diverse entertainment and social spaces. Um, they want to feel immersed in diversity, creativity, excitement, and culture. A lot of the things that you have the beginnings of, a lot of things maybe are missing that again are part of the raw material that we can try to work with within our plan. So how do towns create thriving downtown environments? And that's what we're talking about. It's not just about putting retail and residential downtown. It's how do you create a thriving environment where people want to be and be seen? And there's like three things I'm going to talk about tonight quickly. And again, these are not solutions for what's being presented tonight, but these are background for you to think about as we work through the plan process. First one is what we call hardware and software. The second one is partnerships. And the last one is a steady hand over time. Hardware and software is really about the things that make up a thriving downtown. Everybody thinks about benches and nice sidewalks and good stores. That's kind of the hardware aspect. But there's a software side. What, what happens behind the scenes on a day-to-day -day basis that makes one town more attractive than another? And the first one is a clean and safe environment. From the very first meeting I came to, we heard about the cleanliness issue downtown. I know there's been some things done with additional trash cans and the cigarette butt cans, but if it's not clean and people don't feel safe, they're not going to spend time down there. So you've got to get that done. It's kind of the lowest thing on the hierarchy of needs for a great downtown. 
The second one then is this idea that's come up over the recently called tactical urbanism. And that just means little interventions that make places more interesting for people. Like the parklet that's been built in front of Starbucks. That's the kind of little thing that you see people sitting out there that makes people think differently about their downtown. The third thing are events and programs, so that there is a life downtown. It's not just all hardware, but you come down for a special festival every other month that makes you see something different. It provides that creativity, that culture, and that diversity that I talked about in the trending slide. And then there's this idea of incubating new uses, taking empty sites, taking vacant storefronts, and actually trying out something in there to give people a different view of downtown. What was fabulous last week was the downtown, the workshop we had was in an empty storefront. And it really gave everybody an opportunity to see that space a little differently. It was great for us on the team to be able to go out and walk out in the street and see people coming by all day long. So it really was a way to connect. And that was kind of almost incubating a new use very temporarily. The fifth thing is filling the gaps. And I want you to think about if downtown was owned by one person, they would be consciously looking at all the uses and trying to figure out what's missing and what do we need and what do we have too much of. And then they would be out doing what we call curating the mix. They'd be go out, they'd go find a white tablecloth restaurant. They'd find a, a great barbecue joint. They'd find a certain kind of retail store that you don't have. And that's very hard to do when you have multiple owners and everybody is just looking to lease their space. So it's one of the biggest challenges that downtown has, but it's what makes a great downtown versus one that just has leased businesses. And then the last one, after you've done all of that, comes upgrading the hardware, improving the sidewalks, putting in trees and benches. And unfortunately, a lot of cities tend to focus on this and forget all of this because it's very hard to do, it takes a long time. But without this, over time, all of this effort and investment will be lost. Uh, so so that, that's the kind of hardware software piece. The next piece then is this idea of partnerships. And historically, we've always thought about there's two players in a built environment or in a downtown environment. You have the public sector that puts in the utilities, puts in the sidewalks, puts in the curb and pavement. And then you have the private sector, which builds the buildings. And they each have their roles, and they stop at the property line, and that's the way it works. But recently, we've come to really learn that what makes a great downtown is this seam between the buildings and the streets and the utilities. That's what we call the public realm. And that has to be a public-private partnership because nobody can do that on their own. And it's a constant, it's, a, it's an art and a science to get it right and to manage it over the long term so that it actually functions properly, stays clean, stays interesting, stays diverse. So the steady hand then means that somebody is looking at this over the long term and managing all of these different aspects of the downtown. And the most successful places that we've seen around the country that have kind of figured this out use what is called a bid or a business improvement district. It's not part of the government. It's not a separate private landowner, but it's actually a third party that gets created by those who benefit the most, the business owners as well as the city, and they each, and they provide that steady hand. They get up every morning with one job to make sure the downtown succeeds. So we talk about clean and safe. Most cities use the BID. They pay extra money, they hire a third party contractor, and there is somebody out there steam cleaning the sidewalk, sweeping up the butts, trimming the trees, all that kind of stuff that when it's done right, you don't really notice because it just looks so good. The second thing they do is they're working with the city to do these little interventions. Street furnishing, maybe pull some movable furniture in at night and lock it up, but put it out on a nice day so people feel like the downtown actually is animated. They're working with the chamber to create all kinds of events and programs to make sure there is something happening downtown that puts out the best face for downtown on a monthly or semi-monthly basis. They're working with the city and entrepreneurs to find new uses and try them out. And the reason that the city's important here is they've got to think differently about their regulations and their permitting to allow things like shipping containers to come in for a month and set up a beer garden. That wouldn't normally be some process that you could do easily, but when you put all of those together, that's what creates an interesting mix and might ultimately lead to a permanent use that adds some vitality. <clears throat> then they're working with the landlords of all of the businesses to measure what's missing downtown, and then sitting down and doing playing matchmaker. We know we need a really great white tablecloth restaurant downtown. Let's go find one. Let's go find a good space, and let's bring them all together, and how do we make that happen? 
And then the last thing is they're working with the city on the upgrading of the hardware. They're pulling all of that stuff together and figuring out what's needed after they've tried a lot of these things and saying, okay, we need to widen the sidewalks. We need some more trees over here. We need to provide a little better parking over here. That's after you've kind of figured out what's working and what's not. And the key thing is all of this takes a long time. You have to start with the basics, clean and safe, filling in the gaps, some of these little interventions like you've already done in the early years, moving all the way up to some of the bigger moves later on after you've established what works, what's missing, trial and error to kind of get it right. Now we're gonna go over um, what we are calling the workshop summary, which is what we are here for today. We are um, going to summarize all the activities that we did um, over the last week. And um, as Jim uh, just pointed out, we, were, we set up shop at 439 Broadway, and we were there for anywhere bet from eight to 12 hours um, that we were spending our time here in this space, and it was really great, exciting, because we could walk out and really feel the pulse of the downtown. We could walk out during the lunch hour and get some great food, and um, at the same time, we were able to meet, people were able to walk in, interact, so that was a really, really great um, uh, process for us, for, for the entire project team, to be able to engage with the community at that level. Um, a lot of you would probably recognize this. This was a flyer that went out early on to announce that we were doing this community workshop. And this re is the overview of what we did. We started on uh, Tuesday, November 1st. That was what we're calling the day one. We did a kickoff presentation in this very room. Um, and it was really about giving the background for what we had um, uh, we have been doing so far and what the, what the charrette activities were going to be like. Day two was Wednesday, uh, and we started with a walking tour in the morning of the project area, and I'll go over that a little bit more in detail. And we had a second session called a visioning session in the evening. On Thursday, uh, we met again. Um, um, the community came over at 439 Broadway. We had a hands-on working session where uh, we got uh, down and dirty. We had long maps rolled out, and we had some fun game pieces that we played around with. And day four, which is tonight, um, this really is the summary and, and the wrap-up presentation of what we heard from the community last week. Um, and we are going to uh, see some of those um, thing, the outcomes of, of the week's work. The kickoff presentation, what we did, this presentation is uploaded on um, uh, millbray2040.com, which is the general plan update uh, website. So for those of you who missed this, missed the presentation, uh, please feel free to go online and check it out. Walking tour. We started on, um, uh, on in the morning, 9 a.m. We had a great turnout. We had about 30 people um, that joined us for the presentation. We had we divided our, ourselves into three different groups, and um, uh, the consultant, a couple members from the consultant team, were leading each group as we walked up and down um, the PDA. We had a um, a walking route chalked out and. We actually went from, uh, uh, started at 439 Broadway, we followed this little loop and along El Camino Real downtown and then came back at 439 Broadway. And while we were walking down this route, we were really focusing on um, uh, on three things. There was a cheat sheet that was provided to all um, participants to, to take notes. Um, and also a lot of photo documentation. And what we were focusing on were three things. The first thing was places um, that everybody felt were successful or were contributing to the positive experience of the downtown or, or within the PDA area. The second, uh, um, uh, the second thing that we were focusing on were areas that were problematic from a connectivity and safety point of view. And really, you know, when you're walking down these, um, oh, as, you're, uh, as you're 
crossing the streets and walking down the streets, it's really you start to feel what the what the challenges are, and that was very um, revealing for for us also to hear uh, from from the participants what their specific challenges were as they experienced these things day in day out. And the third thing that we were also focusing on were what are the areas of improvement? Improvement um, as far as public um, public realm is concerned, um, and at the same time, opportunities for infill development. And this is the summary. What we heard um, as far as the places, uh, successful places were is that um, central, uh, the blocks, uh, uh, central blo Broadway between uh, Taylor and La Cruz uh, felt uh, seemed to have the right ingredients and um, were places that were quite active, and this really is the heart of the downtown. Um, the new condominiums at Shadbourne and El Camino Real, they seem to be contributing, they uh, have a contributing scale as they are on El Camino Real and making that corner quite um, uh, sort of a gateway at the, at currently uh, considering that there isn't anything as significant at that corner. Um, the old theater sign as a gateway element, which is a historic um, feature, and that was something that a lot of people had very positive um, feeling about, and that it lent to the identity of the community. Uh, parklets at Millbrae Square, the one outside Starbucks, and another one just uh, down, down the street, uh, which were something really positive that people really enjoyed. And um, the breezeway at Millbrae Square that connects um, Millbrae Square um, and downtown with, this, with City Hall. Places of safety and connectivity. Um, there were, uh, there, you know, largely almost everybody felt that the sidewalk conditions can be improved. There were challenges with the with the current state of the sidewalks. Um, in a pro unhappiness about inappropriate and inconsistent species of street trees. Um, the function of frontage streets, um, there are some um, challenges with circulation and um, getting in and out and um, going back onto El Camino Real. And crossings along El Camino Real, which um, almost every single crossing had a cha was challenging as far as pedestrians are concerned, considering that this is a really wide street, six lanes with, uh, with high-speed traffic. Um, and there was a lot of desire uh, for direct and safe, establishing direct and safe access to, uh, to the BART station, uh, both from, uh, for bikes as well as pedestrians. Opportunity sites, um, the frontage streets um, seem like good opportunity sites for improvement, for uh, having better public realm. Um, and um, this was something that was pointed out, which was quite interesting that we had not heard before, was the alleys. Um, and um, a lot of people thought that activating these alleys would be really, really um, a great feature for the downtown and could be assets um, as, as a downtown improves. And this is a map that um, that sort of summarizes some of the some of the opportunity areas. Uh, uh, this particular one at the northern end, uh, where already there is there are some good things happening here with wider sidewalks, and um, there is a lot of potential here to to do something something nice and take um, you know take advantage of the the existing infrastructure here as uh, for, from a public realm point of view. Um, and then there were a number of these sites. Uh, it's a little bit hard to um, hard to read probably on the screen, but um, some of these sites were identified as potential infill uh, development sites. Visioning session. This was the evening uh, on the same day right after, um, after the walking tour in the morning. Um, we again had a really great attendance between 40 to 50 people that joined us for the visioning session. We, um, it was a breakout session where um, uh, there were, I believe, six or seven tables with um, six or seven participants per table. And the purpose of this exercise really was a, um, to not, uh, you know, we, we, during the walking tour, we really understood the existing conditions and what currently exists and the challenges that are there. What we wanted to do during, uh, during the visioning session was to really uh, dream a little bit and be aspirational and think about all the things that are possible in this community. And the way we talked about these was through describing three scenarios. 
So we had three identified three scenarios that we wanted everybody to uh, to speak to. We wanted the groups to talk about um, their ideal experience. Um, one was um, considering, if, if, imagine you're on your way to work on a Tuesday morning. The second experience was, um, you know, you're going out for dining or entertainment on, on a Thursday evening, either in downtown or El Camino Real. And um, the, the third one was that you're making a shopping trip on a weekend, um, Saturday morning. And you had to really imagine what your ideal experience would be. And it was a really great experience. I really enjoyed, I have to say, this was my favorite experience because it generated such an animated conversation about all the things that people would like to do. P uh, you know, we heard things like um, people would, everyone would love to walk. Uh, to the downtown and be able to smell coffee in the morning and be able to smell beautiful flowers, be able to listen to music as they're walking down, um, being able to access BART very safely and easily and not be worried about oncoming traffic so that they could get to work or they can get to other parts, um, uh, you know, in places outside of Millbrae. So there were, there were a lot of great ideas that came out of this. Um, what we did was we went, we collected all these ideas, and there were a number of common themes that we heard. Um, and we categorized them under three major themes. One was related to transportation, the other related to land uses, and uh, the third one related to public space. Um, under transportation, we heard a lot about um, parking. And clearly, parking is a challenge, and we recognize that. And um, you know, the the important thing is to be able to balance parking um, and any future growth. So that's something that you know ha is is a uh, is a consideration as we will be developing these plans further. Design for 880. Designing for kids, um, you know, somebody as old, um, some 80-year-old as well as an 80-year-old, which means uh, safety and uh, being able to enjoy, um, uh, enjoy the environment and the downtown regardless of what age you are, um, and that there wouldn't be any barriers for anybody. Creating spacious pedestrian environment, as we talked about, like what does that mean? Spacious environments, pedestrian friendly environments, experiences that make, your, make walking really, really enjoyable. Um, alternate transportation modes, could those be shuttles or feeder transit or other kinds of transportation modes um, that are an alternative to automobile? Um, safe, and, safe walkways and crosswalks, um, improving crossings along El Camino Real, as we, which going back to the analysis, previous analysis diagram, clearly there is, um, there, there is a challenge um, along El Camino Real with these crossings. Um, again, establishing safe and direct access to BART, um, you know, maybe a transit-only lane along El Camino Real, and improved bikeways and bike parking. Um, there seems to be a desire for being able to bike, um, and how can that biking infrastructure be improved? Um, under land uses, we heard a lot about bringing more diversity in the downtown, and diversity uh, in the food, um, uh, diversity of restaurants, diversity of shopping, um, different formats of shopping, some, you know, a large format mixed with small formats maybe. Um, potentially having some office space downtown. Um, hotels near BART um, and cultural amenities. There was a strong desire for bringing culture into the downtown, having performing arts, um, uh, some, some form of performing arts venue, a, ve a venue for community theater, recreation center, um, or music club. Music was very, uh, we heard this um, actually quite frequently about bringing music to downtown in different ways. Public space, public space, um, you know, everything that was talked about you, as far as improving pedestrian em environment in the public realm, uh, you know, in expanding the crosswalks, uh, sidewalks, and so on and so forth, that kind of definitely continues with the public space theme. Um, there was a desire for uh, not only ha having better sidewalks and outdoor cafes, but 
um, in making them, uh, you know, making them better by having consistent tree canopy, protected walking environments, um, introducing maybe a public plaza or a park downtown, which currently doesn't exist um, as much, um, other than the parklets, um, integrating public art. Uh, we have um, we had uh, quite a few champions for public art, and that was really uh, uh, it came through even in the, the concepts that you will see. So public art was really an important factor to consider, and then programmatic um, interventions. Uh, for instance, um, you know what Jim was talking about in, uh, as far as the program, the software, and um, some ideas that came out related to that was can can Broadway be closed uh, for traffic for automobile traffic? maybe once a month to make it pedestrian, so it, to enjoy the, enjoy the street in a different way than we currently do, experience it differently. Can there be a night street market, um, pop-up music, uh, pop music venues, events for business travelers, block parties, free Wi-Fi throughout, uh, you know, bringing technology to, to the downtown, bringing technology to the public space, and making it uh, more attractive for, for everyone, um, you know, different demographics. And um, electric bike share, um, as well as other, uh, you know, fun things like bringing some sport activities like chess, checkers, and table tennis for youth. So there, was, there were a number of these ideas that came um, out from these visioning sessions. And all of these um, ideas really continued into the next um, exercise that we did, which was the following night. And Jim is going to talk more about what we did during those exercises and share some fun, some more fun things. Great, thank you, Poonam. And I know we have about five minutes before we need to break uh, for you guys. So I'm going to do this next piece in about five minutes. Uh, I wanted to comment on. There was a lot of feedback about music uh, from these different exercises, and Poonam touched on, on some of those. But that was something that struck me, is that there's a lot of interest in music in this town and finding different ways to bring that uh, into the downtown, you know, in, you know, different sized venues or, or just ad hoc spaces where, where bands can play. So I, I thought that was a, a really interesting bit of input. So the concept exploration, this was the exercise that we did Thursday evening. And this is what it looked like. There was water and food all over these tables, as well as the game pieces, and a, and a lot of really engaged people. Um, so it was, a, it was a really productive night. Every table had one of these maps on the table. And then each table had a number of these game pieces. And they were both. Public, uh, public improvements game pieces, so things like bike lanes, like streetscape improvements, uh, crosswalks, uh, s signals, things like that, landmarks, but also land uses to fill in. So residential land uses, uh, commercial land uses, uh, parking, where might additional parking want to go? And then specialty things like should there be a hotel uh, in certain places or, or a conference center in certain places. And then the pluses and minuses were just to keep in mind that certain land uses were uh, revenue producing, like the, the chart Jim showed where hotel is going to produce a lot more revenue. It can help pay for some of the other public improvements um, and uh, commercial space also. Uh, can pay to a degree. Housing, although it's needed, it's not going to pay as much revenue. It's a little bit closer to break even, et cetera. So as the, as the participants put these pieces on the game boards, they were trying to keep a balance of things that got us revenue and things that, that cost money uh, in terms of public space improvements. And then these were six of the schemes that, that came out of that. And I just wanted to point out, there's, these were just, these were amazing. You know, they were really some creative ideas. And I just wanted to point out some things that, that were unique to each of the six. Uh, this one had a lot of emphasis on mixed 
use housing infill. So that means retail on the ground floor and housing above. So you can see some here near the station area. You can see some here uh, further down El Camino Real by the, by the El Rancho. Uh, some infill sites here, same thing, housing over ground floor retail. Uh, a site here on the, on the city uh, parking lot across from uh, Civic Center. This one also uh, had a little infill spot down here where Poonam mentioned is a place where there's some activity already starting to happen in terms of improvements. This one had a little shopping node around a city park uh, right there near the downtown, near Safeway. Uh, in fact, right next to Safeway. And then this had a little node about uh, midway between uh, the BART station and uh, Millbrae Square with a little hotel and conference node on, on the east side of El Camino Real. Um, so just some really interesting ideas there. This one had a lot of emphasis on improvements along El Camino Real, aggressive streetscape streetscape improvements and bike lanes all along El Camino Real. Uh, some housing infill along on the east side, also down here. Uh, some parking improvements here uh, on, the, on the current uh, parking area of, of Millbrae Square. Uh, I think this one had a movie theater uh, recommended here. Uh, and then uh, a little nightclub site here another public park uh, in downtown using the city lot. And I think some of the usage of the city lot was putting parking underneath with a park on top or putting retail on the ground floor and parking above. So there were certainly some ideas being talked about to, you know, to add parking um, to, you know, to be able to accommodate some of the uh, developed uses. And then a little parking area, additional parking area down here, again, by the, by the Civic Center. Um, just a couple more of these before we have to break. This one had a, an extensive uh, public park on the current parking lot of Millbrae, Millbrae Square and Safeway. Obviously, you would have to do something with that parking that would need to go underground or in a different, a different uh, site. But the idea of bringing a green space to downtown uh, was part of this scheme. Uh, this one had some other housing infill and some streetscape improvements along Broadway as well as along El Camino Real. Uh, this scheme was, was great. They had a, a very uh, sort of defined approach to different districts. So the station area had a big block of uh, high density housing. And then this whole downtown area was a restaurant district. So not a lot of infill except on the east side over here. Uh, but in this area, really curating the restaurant mix and doing lots of streetscape improvements along Broadway, doing aggressive streetscape improvements along El Camino Real, but no bike lane on El Camino Real. The scheme said, let's do a bike loop around the downtown, but let's not necessarily put bikes on El Camino Real. And then a very strong housing infill district uh, over here on the, on the north end of, of the street. And then lastly, these last two put lots of housing infill, big emphasis on housing. Every place there was viewed to be an opportunity site, there's some housing infill. This one associated with parking uh, near downtown. Here again, a little public park downtown. Uh, lots of opportunities for public art on this scheme. And then uh, the thing I haven't mentioned that was common to all these schemes was much more attention to crossing safety at all of these different intersections, crossing from, from the uh, BART station over to the downtown area. Uh, and then this one had uh, quite a, uh, a dense or, or a new retail block uh, at the Office Depot site uh, here near uh, Millbrae Square. And then aggressive improvements along El Camino Real and along the frontage road. So this one paid attention uh, to the frontage roads and improving those so that they, they feel safer and, and more pedestrian. And then some, uh, some housing infill on the east side. So I think that takes us to 725. We're going to have to take a break here. Excuse yeah, me. sir. Before they have a break, who's financing this study? 
Uh, this is financed through uh, mainly through grants uh, from from Caltrans and other uh, other state grants, and and there's a um, actually Chelsea, you know the mix, okay. and then there there are some city funds uh, going to this as well. Yeah, there are. Uh, I would say the smaller portion are city funds, and then the greater portion are are from these grants. Yeah. So, great. Thank you for for your time. Okay. Thank you. So we are going to take a break so that the Planning Commission and people who are interested in our agenda for this evening, we're going to go back over to our um, original location. And then other members of the audience are welcome to stay for the remainder of the presentation and even a question answer period. So, thank Great. you. Thank you. Just a brief break. We have break. about 10 minutes to wrap up the presentation and then we're going to go into question and answer after that. Yeah. 